the very thought of vacationing fills our mind with happiness and excitement. And I'm sure many of you might have Europe as your dream destination. You might want to visit the Eiffel Tower in Paris or take a gondola ride on the canals in Venice. Now, when we talk about visiting Europe, I'm sure no one has heard someone telling that they are going to visit the Habsburg monarchy or even the Austro-Hungarian Empire. You instead hear about places like England, France, Germany, Italy, Spain. But I'm sure you might be left with a question as in what caused these nations to come into being? What was the founding head of these nations? These nations, as you must know, did not exist as nations even around 200 or 300 years ago. In this lesson, we will be focusing on certain very important concepts. We will learn about how changes took place throughout Europe. We will also learn about how these nations came into being. And the focus of this lesson will be one spirit that holds all the people in these nations together. So let us now begin this very fascinating journey where we will be learning much about the history of Europe through the 19th century. Now let me ask you certain very important questions here. Do you know what the difference is between a kingdom and a nation? Now, what do these concepts of kingdom and nation mean? Do you live in a nation or a kingdom? And in the place you live in, does it have a national flag, a national anthem, a national bird, a national language? What are these things? So just a while ago, we posed certain very important questions. And the first question that we will be addressing here is that, what is a kingdom? Well, in a kingdom, it is the king who is the ultimate authority. So kingdoms are spatial or territorial units which are ruled by kings or queens. Now these kings or queens hold ultimate or absolute power in the kingdoms. That is to say, they work or function as the final law in the land. And all the people who live in those kingdoms are to abide by the king's or the queen's decree. So a king or a queen lies at the foundation of a kingdom. So this is what we understand by monarchical kingdoms. So these monarchs, as you can see here, hold ultimate power over the masses and over the land as a whole. Now we learned about what a kingdom is and in kingdoms, kings or queens or the monarchs hold ultimate power. But what happens when many kingdoms are put together? Many kingdoms together constitute an empire. And in fact, many empires which existed in the face of earth often spanned across several continents. And in these empires, people from different communities, different ethnicities, different religions, different classes stayed together. Now, if we look at this map closely, we will be able to see the Ottoman Empire. Now, the Ottoman Empire spanned across three continents, which were Europe, Asia and Africa. So, can you understand how huge these empires were? These empires contained many small territorial units and these empires were formed by annexing more and more regions so as to increase the extent of the empire. Now the question that we posed in the beginning of this lesson was what is the difference between a kingdom and a nation? Now opposed to the concept of a kingdom we have something called a nation. Now a nation comprises a community of people who often share common history, common ancestry. They also share common aspirations and 
interests. So, contrary to a kingdom where the king or the queen or the monarch is the absolute authority, people in a nation hold the power. And it is for this reason that nations are also called people power because people hold the final power in a nation. People are staying together because they feel rooted to a shared history. They feel rooted to share aspirations of remaining independent from any foreign domination. A nation is an abstract concept. Now when people living together in a nation form a country, it is known as a nation state. Now in modern world, most of the countries that we can see throughout the world are nation states. Now in these nation states, the people hold ultimate power in the land in most of the cases. Now here we can see certain nation states here. How do we identify the nation states? We identify the nation states with the flag, with the national anthem, with the national song, with the national bird, with the national animal of that particular nation state. And people living together in a nation state most often share common history and their goals, their aspirations, their interests are also similar in most of the cases. And it is these factors that together hold the people together in the nation states. So having learned about the difference between a kingdom and a nation, let us now go back in time to the 1700s. Now Europe in the 1700s comprised multinational empires. Just a while ago we mentioned this point that many empires spanned across several continents and in this context we also cited the example of the Ottoman Empire that spanned across Europe, Africa and Asia and these empires were multinational that is to say they consisted of many of these modern nation states. Now, have you heard anyone telling you that they are going to the Holy Roman Empire or the French monarchy or the Habsburg monarchy or the Spanish monarchy? Most definitely not because these empires have given way to the modern independent nations. So, present day Europe comprises many independent nations. This is how the map of present day Europe looks. So, in the place of the Habsburg monarchy, the French empire or the Austro-Hungarian empire, we have countries like Austria, Prussia, France, Germany. So, this is how there are many independent nations together in present day Europe. And most of these nations are also liberal democracies. Now by liberal democracy we refer to a political system in which people hold absolute power in the sense that people get to elect their representatives who run the government. So the erstwhile monarchs, emperors who ruled the empires or the monarchies were replaced and in place now came the liberal democracies. Before proceeding with this lesson, let me ask you a question. Present day Europe constitutes several kingdoms and monarchies. Do you think this statement is true or false? Well, the correct answer is that the statement is false because present day Europe does not constitute several kingdoms and empires. Instead, it is made up of several independent nation states. This discussion here brings us to another very crucial question. Why were empires replaced in Europe? It cannot be possible that suddenly one fine morning all these empires were replaced by nation states. It must have happened through a series of changes. It was a state of transition. But what caused this change? What caused this transition? 
For this, we will have to go back to the time where the empires and the monarchies ruled various parts of Europe. Now, these empires were huge in their extent. They spanned across several nations or even several continents in certain cases. And people from different ethnic groups or different ethnicities stayed together in these empires. Now, these people did not share a common history, a common ancestry, a common aspiration or interest. And so, these people were not united together. And in fact, the rulers or the monarchs who ruled these empires and kingdoms did not really encourage unity among these various ethnicities who had to live together in the empires. Now, these empires were formed by annexing nearby regions and so people living in those regions were brought together under one empire. They did not relate to that empire's interest as a whole. In fact, there was no national identity, so to speak. So, these empires that spanned over vast territories and were inhabited by different ethnic groups did not have any binding factor. If we look here, we will be able to see a map of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now, here we can see how people from different ethnic groups like the Czechs, the Poles, the Ukrainians, the Slovaks, the Romanians, the Hungarians, the Germans, the Slovens, the Serbo-Croatians together lived in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So, can you understand how there were so many different ethnic groups living together? And it was inevitable that these people did not relate with each other. And so, there was no factor to hold all these people together. So, this is one of the reasons why the empires over the years, over the centuries were being destabilized. Another very important point in this regard that we need to keep in our minds is that the emperors were often considered outsiders. Why is it so? Because these emperors were foreign or alien to the people living in the lands, living within the empires. Now, let me give you an example here. We just saw how people from different groups lived together in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now, these people did not relate to the emperor who was sitting on the throne. And this emperor was also foreign to these people. This emperor might also have a different ethnic belonging. And so, these emperors various interests and aspirations were not in line with that of the people living in his land. And so, these people treated the emperor as outsider or foreigner. So, this is another reason why the foundation of the empires was shaken over the decades. Because these emperors, these monarchs, formed the empires by annexing different regions, there used to be no centralized administration. And these people who did not relate with the cause of the emperor did not feel any kind of commitment, responsibility or reverence for the emperor. And so, they did not really have any kind of loyalty to show for the empire. And it is for this reason public discontentment brewed up in the minds of the masses. These masses felt that a foreign ruler, an alien ruler was suddenly ruling them without taking into account their interests, their requirements and demands. So, public discontentment was one of the many common things in empires due to the lack of loyalty or commitment to the head of the state. Then, administration was also not centralized. That is to say, there was no central administration. Centralized laws were also not prevalent during this time. Now, during this time, one system that governed most of these empires, these monarchies was the system of feudalism. What do we understand by feudalism? Feudalism is a system of allotting privileges that are granted owing to the amount of lands owned by a feudal lord. 
so these feudal lords were very wealthy and these feudal lords had their own sets of laws and ways of governance in their own feudal estates now many feudal estates together made up these empires so there was no one centralized law to take care of everything in the empire instead there were various laws various systems within the feudal estates on the top of the system was the monarch or the emperor and below him the clergy comprised the first estate now the nobility comprised the second estate and literally all the masses who did not belong to the first and the second estates comprised the third estate now these nobility these aristocrats were the feudal lords and these people enjoyed and exercised their power in their own feudal estates and people living in the feudal estates had to abide by these laws had to pay taxes and various kinds of cesses to these feudal lords so what we need to keep in our minds is that there was no central administration in the empires and monarchies now let me give you an example here these empires these monarchies were ruled by the emperors or monarchs and these territorial units were divided into several feudal estates and these were ruled by the feudal lords who were very wealthy they imposed their own taxes they enjoyed their rights in the feudal estates so the systems of governance the laws were very different no trade was not really easy among and within these feudal estates if a trader had to trade with these feudal estates he had to continue paying different taxes in these different estates and because of this reason the trader found it very difficult how can he keep on paying taxes in the various estates it's not really easy and so traders were angered because of this lack of central administration lack of centralized laws trade became very difficult in the erstwhile empires and monarchies the traders had to pay multiple custom duties and it is for this reason that they were angered and infuriated it's inevitable that one trader had to pay custom duties if that person had to trade with some region outside the empire or monarchy but within the same empire why would a trader pay so many custom duties so because of the lack of centralized laws and the prevalence of different kinds of laws in the several feudal estates trade activities continued to be disrupted in the empires over time now these traders or the wealthy business class now demanded that trade barriers should be removed and they also wanted to form nation states where there would be a uniform set of laws because without a uniform set of laws without a centralized law it became increasingly difficult for these traders to continue trade activities which is why they were now wanting to form new nation states now several kinds of rebellion protests broke out in different parts of the empires over the years now we learned that people from different ethnic groups stayed together in the empires and friction was inevitable among these ethnic groups so they kept on fighting amongst themselves and at the same time they could show no loyalty to the king or the monarch so all in all they did not want to remain this way under the rule of one absolute monarch and all these reasons together led to the decay of the empires so here we can see how there were many reasons that together contributed to the decay of the empires with this we come to an end of our discussion on kingdoms and monarchies in europe as they were and how they paved the way to the formation of nation states 
Now, a very important question that we addressed here is that nation states are very different in ideology from the kingdoms. Now, these kingdoms were places or territorial units which were ruled by the monarchs, the emperors. And in these empires, in these monarchies, in these kingdoms, people did not really enjoy their say. But in nation states, people were in power and so nation states have been rightly called people power. But we also learnt about the reasons why people were filled with discontent, with anger and rebellion within these empires. Now when these people were rebelling against the monarchs, they were wanting to form nation states. But something was required to hold these people together. Now let me give you a very simple example. If you are doing an art and craft project, you will require a glue to hold the various pieces of paper together. Now what was that one glue that held all these people together in their aspiration to overthrow the monarchies, in their aspiration to form new nation states? It was this one spirit of nationalism. By nationalism, we mean that spirit that unites the people of a nation together, that gives them a sense of belonging, gives them a sense of rootedness. It is this discussion on nationalism that we will be taking up further in our subsequent lesson. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. You can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the Delta Step app to learn one to one with our amazing teachers or to get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus. Master each topic with our adaptive practice technology. Get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests. Get all your doubts resolved instantly. Learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and iPads. So at Delta Step, learning is not just fun and easy, it's rewarding too. So register for free now.